Many people have asked me to do a video on what goes into set preparation. So in this video, I'm gonna talk through my personal process with the goal that you can put together some really pumping sets that people will respond really well to. So the first step is always research. So for instance, let's use the drum and bass set I did last week, okay? so. First of all, okay, I wanted to get together a really cool traction, uh, sorry, collection of tracks to pull from and also get some inspiration. So love it or hate it, right? Beatport is really, really good for kind of like scouting out music. And let's say I haven't played drum and bass for a while. And you could just go to Beatport, go to the genre part, look at drum and bass and just see what are all the popular drum and bass tracks right now. But here's the problem. If I'm only using all Beatport, right, well then you run the risk of sounding like everyone else. So in truth, right, sure Beatport's one method, but personally, right, I suggest then finding artists that you gel with and then going and searching their live sets. And with any luck, there may be a track list of all the songs they've played in the description or in the comments somewhere. And if not, I may be able to find the track list for those sets using 1001tracklist.com. So 1001 Tracklist is actually a really cool site for knowing exactly what big DJs are played. And what I'll do is I'll link that in below. But drawing from Beatport and live sets, honestly, gives you plenty to work with. And let's face it, the more tracks that you have to choose from, the better. See, that's honestly the, the area I think everyone's going wrong. See, what they do is they think, okay, they're playing for an hour. So they think, okay, each song's two, three minutes. So let's say an hour, so I only need 20 or 30 tracks. But if you wanna build a cool playlist of 20 tracks, you may need 50 options to pull from as finding tracks that complement one another and the tracks that also take people on the journey is honestly the tricky part and you need lots of options to be able to achieve that. So here's the thing, once I have a smorgasbord of tracks, right, I download them, usually through Beatport or some DJ pullers, this supports the artist and also ensures I'm getting the full version of the track at a high bit rate. And then what I do is I import my tracks into my DJ software. And before I do anything, I usually then analyze the key using the mixed in key software. Now, sure, Recordbox has its own key analysis software, which is pretty cool. But mixing key does have more options, right? So if you want to know more about mixing and key and want more detailed descriptions and guidance on set preps, I actually have this whole section in my free mini course on set prep. So I'll link that in below is the free content I give away. It's honestly huge, okay? And it's actually helped a lot of people. Now anyway, okay, once I have the keys, okay, I guess then you have to personally decide whether or not you wanna map your tracks with cue points or mix without cues. Now, there are advantages for both methods and I'm gonna dive a bit deeper into that in a minute, so stick around, there's a fair bit on cue points, right? But Let's say you have your tracks and your keys and possibly some cue points, right? I then begin the process of arrangement, but here's the other area where people make the mistake. Quite often, right, they just like run their music through their software and then they try to work on the arrangement and crafting a playlist on the actual equipment itself. And personally, yeah, I find it so much easier to just map the set and find tracks that work well together on my computer. And this means, right, by the time I hit the gear, I already have something to work with. So I'm just sitting there on the couch, just kind of like, you know, headphones on, that kind of thing. So here's the thing, to map your tracks on your computer, just find the software's two-player mode and start jamming around with options, probably just crossfading and stuff, right, with your mouse. But, and then here's the thing, when I find tracks that sound great together, I usually put them into a rough order. Now in truth, I usually treat my first attempt at building a playlist kind of like a rough draft. And once I feel I have the beginnings of something, I then export the music onto a USB, or if you have a controller, you know, connect the computer to your controller and all that, and I guess then practice some of the transitions. But here's the thing, when practicing transitions, sometimes it, it can be a little bit boring for me. So sometimes I just go for a recording, meaning I treat it like my recording kind of like a live set and I record myself playing from start to finish. Now this adds a little bit of pressure and yes, I want it to be perfect, but it also forces me to like listen to more of the tracks and, and from that I can gel more with the music and I get a better feel for the overall set as opposed to just fast forwarding tracks and practicing transitions. Both are good, like you can do both. Sometimes I do do both, but I'm just saying recording sometimes it feels good. 
Now, let's say once I've got my first recording, I either listen back to it and get a feel for perhaps areas that might need work, or perhaps when I was playing, I even just recognized some areas. I thought, you know, that bit needs a bit of work. And sometimes I don't even listen back to the mix. I just sort of more did that, keep the pressure on, but don't even listen back. And then I just go and rework the playlist with the idea of just kind of like making constant and never ending improvements. So, and maybe just reworking the set and maybe some tracks didn't go as well together as I thought. So for instance, in my recent drum and bass mix, I played this track called London Burn It Up. And the first time I played it, I had it placed only a few tracks into the set. And it kind of like brought the energy of the mix back a little bit too early, like in my opinion. And so what I did was I went back to the drawing board on my computer and I reshuffled the playlist around a bit. And I ended up putting that track further into the mix. And then what happened was, so I had it going hard a bit. And then when I came to that part in the mix, kind of in, near the end of the mix, it's like people had earned a break by that time. So it kind of helped the actual full, kind of like the flow a little bit. And that's what you're kind of listening to. And that's another advantage of recording because sometimes when you're playing, you're caught in it, you know what I mean? Just having all this fun, but you listen back and you're like, you know what, that, that kind of dropped off there. It's not kind of right. And that means you, you get ideas and you rework it. Okay, but then once I have reworked it, I usually do record it again. I like the recording thing, right? But, um, but anyway, and if it's an important show that like, let's say I'm preparing for, sometimes I may even repeat that process a few times, meaning I'm preparing, you know, researching, preparing, practicing, recording, listening, tweaking, and doing that process a few times until I have something that I'm really actually happy with. But here's the thing, and some important things to note here, and that is, Sometimes you just hop on to play and it's just not going right, okay? And you're just not feeling it and you're just kind of like, uh, you're, just, you're just not in sync with it, all right? And so in that case, my advice, when in doubt, lean out. And I either just step away altogether and come back later. Or more often, you know, if I want to be productive, I go back to the computer and usually get more tracks and do more prep work. And sometimes that's a bit of a, like a pattern interrupt, okay? It gets me thinking differently. And then when I return to the decks, perhaps this time around with even more inspiring tracks and stuff that you know, I'm gelling with maybe, then it comes to life a lot faster. So in short, you 100% don't want to force anything that's not working. And if you're not 100% gelling with your set, then what chances is there of your crowd gelling with it? So you need to have high standards and you really need to craft something magical that you can share and actually be proud of. So the good news is, right, I get all my students to make and record mixtapes for me and they're, man, I listen to them, they're world class, like they really are. And in my experience, once I've taught students everything they need to know to DJ confidently, the best thing they can do is record themselves and practice like over and over doing the process I'm talking about now, just, you know, with the goal constant and never any improvements. But anyway, this opens up though some other pretty big questions and that is if playing live, do you always prepare and know exactly what you're going to play and play the tracks in the same order? Okay, now in short, yes and no. So firstly, I would say the majority of big touring DJs do that and I know that because Let's say I watch the same DJ play in two different states. Quite often they play the exact same set. But personally, when playing live in the local scene, I would always over prepare. And you 100% need to respond to the vibe of the crowd. And if you've crafted a playlist, and let's say it's not working, you need to abandon your plan and start feeling out what the crowd is into. Let's see, here's the thing. I know that can be scary. But if you continue with a planned set and you, let's say you got the music or the feel or even the genre wrong, it can honestly be catastrophic for the atmosphere in the club. So anyway, in my actual club ready course, I have so much on that, right? And also a ton of really valuable insights. Like I've got a club pack section, so I'll link that in below as well. But anyway, okay. One more question you may have, and that is, do I always use cue points or can you just freestyle without cues? And I would say that actually depends a lot on the genre that you're playing and also your style of mixing. So put it this way, right? Back in the day with vinyl, there was no cues. And even though it was limiting compared to what we can do these days on modern gear, okay? 
It also kind of felt organic and it was more about gelling with the music and track selection and creating mood. And honestly, no matter what gear we're on, we still want to hold on to that. I think I like that. I like like, you know, being engaged with the music more and less visuals. I've always been about that. But on the other hand, okay, setting cues can allow you to map something very special and allows you to always play the best parts of each track. See, both methods are different and I'm not gonna say one way is better than the other. But my advice for beginners would be, if you want to mix without cue points, perhaps first of all, try setting some cues. And by doing so, you get a feel for what the waveform looks like and you start to notice patterns with the music and you, you get this greater knowledge of how music and how it all works. And you can then take better educated guesses when mixing without cues. And you're probably in a better position to mix without cues by first of all setting a bunch of cue points. But again, it does depend a little bit on the genre that you're playing. So for instance, if I'm energy mixing, which means always playing the best parts of the tracks and doing mashups on the flies, replacing the drops, double drops, putting this bit on that bit, you know, energies in the build, so much more, all that, right? Then cues makes that so much easier and gives me a lot more control. But if I was playing music that's more drawn out in feel, where it feels more about the journey, then you could experiment with mixing without cues. So anyway, how about I do that next week, okay? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a minimal deep tech mix where I'm gonna do zero prep, zero cues, and let's just see how I go, okay? It's kind of fun, it really is. So anyway, this video was more of a talk through, but again, in my course, I have full video breakdowns of everything I just said with step-by-step -step cheat sheets and so much more. People are always messaging me saying how their DJing has been transformed in weeks by doing the courses. So if you feel you would benefit from a more structured approach, which in truth, if you ask me as a teacher, honestly, structure, that's how people need to learn. Like I just see that from one-on-ones, but then again, so yeah, I hundred percent. I'll link in the course below, right? And at the moment, I actually have this sale on my complete package, meaning I've bundled every course I've ever made, which means actually getting 20 years of experience infused in you in weeks, kind of like in that matrix, and they have that, they download the Kung Fu training. It's like, wow, you know? So it'll be like, wow, you know, and honestly, your DJing will come to life very, very quickly, I assure you. So I actually really love doing that for people and I'm getting a ton of really big feedback. It's actually taken off big time, but anyway. Anyway, thanks again so much for your support. Hopefully this video has helped give you some ideas and inspiration. And basically keep an eye out for next week's minimal deep tech or deep house, deep tech yeah, that mix, right? With zero prep, just download and play. And I'll see if I can make it work. Okay, we'll see. Thank you.